building in August, and the project was completed on time and under, under budget. The second phase is, is underway right now at, at Kern. The second phase uh, of the project is, is currently under construction and it's it's on schedule and on time also. We are actually having a, a tour tomorrow with Dr. Murillo and, and the local paper um, do a story on that project so that we'll look forward to seeing that. And then tonight I wanted to talk about phase three which is a renovation of Wilson Middle School which would be which would start um, uh, next summer and go through the school year. And our plans are, you know, as we looked at the bid schedule on this project, we developed two schedules, an early bid and a, and a later bid. <clears throat> and we had the, the holiday break um, in, mixed in between. So we um, strategically decided to bid it early. The, so the bid period, and I'll go through the schedule, <clears throat> the early before the holiday schedule rather than wait till after the first of the year to, to get a jump on some of the bidding with the contractors. So here with me tonight is Roger Slauson with BVH. He's the lead architect for um, for the project. And he's going to go through the, the the plans and the details of the project. As you know, this this renovation <clears throat> design was based on a facility audit that was completed a year ago, and it was based on feedback from students and faculty, teachers, and community. And the, um, they identified four areas of need, safety and security, accessibility, building systems, and energy in the learning environment. Now the areas that we're going to cover in this presentation, um, we'll review the site plan, and we'll show you what the exterior will look like, um, the interior floor plan, finishes and room configuration, then we'll talk, I'll go through the project costs and the schedule and then we'll answer any questions. So with that, I'll ask Roger to come forward. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Roger Slauson from BVH Architecture. So I'm here to uh, show, revisit the, the plans that we've been in front of you a few times. Um, there's really been no substantial changes since the last time we were here, but we'll certainly uh, step through them again here quickly. Uh, so this is the site plan that you see on the screen now. Uh, the existing building all shows up in white, and we have two new additions. The addition to the uh, west is a new secured entry and administration and student services area. Um, the small addition in red uh, up there on the northeast is a new kitchen addition to allow for uh, uh, a change in the, the way meals are served and, and some new freezers and coolers and things like that, just an improved kitchen access. Um, Drop off to the uh, west, the circular, circular drive, that will be used primarily for the bus uh, traffic. Uh, we're also adding up at the northwest a small new parking area right outside the uh, entry area to the specialized programs area. Um, the existing parking lot on the south will be used for parent drop off, so we keep the parent drop off and bus drop off separate. And also on the south, uh, it's labeled there at uh, New Student Plaza. It's just kind of an expanded paving area, um, some built-in benches, um, some upgrade lighting right there, so that as you enter for activities from that south parking lot, it gives a little nicer feel, a little more plaza-like feel to that area. So this is uh, looking northeast. Uh, at the new uh, admin and student services edition. So we have a new uh, uh, secured entryway there. Um, kind of the taller space in the middle is, is the front doors. We refer to it as the entry commons. So as you come through the secured entry, um, you're into a, a wide open space. There will be a, a picture of it coming up here. But a larger space uh, just to increase circulation and, and small gathering. 
So this is as you go in the front doors. This, this is the learning team commons, or the learning commons. And I don't know what. I'll have Dave help us out here. All right. <laughs> So that's, uh, this is the, uh, like I say, right when you come in the front doors, that's going to be your view. So to your left will be the administrative area, uh, student services area, and then straight ahead you'll enter into the building and head down to the classroom areas. Um, as part of the plan, you also have a, what we call a learning team common space uh, in each grade level. Uh, so it's, it's a larger uh, open area as close as we could get it to centralized in each grade level for uh, student use, break multiple uses, breakouts, uh, small groups, larger groups, um, and just a, a real, I guess, nice kind of more home-like feel. Um, with some skylights added to get some natural light in there. This will also be the place where the uh, media is distributed to. So uh, just like Kern, um, each of these areas will house a portion of, of the existing uh, books and, and periodicals. Uh, this is what's the existing small gym or the older gym. Um, so pretty much the same program that we had at, at Kern, where we're gonna take that space and make it more of a multi-purpose room, a little bit less of a gymnasium. It'll still have the wood floor, it'll still have basketball goals uh, but we're going to put in some new bleachers, uh, just like we did at, at Kern with the uh, chair back uh, style bleachers, and uh, upgrade the acoustics so that it's more friendly to uh, presentations and things like that. So it'll be a little quieter space. Gyms, you always want to be as loud as you can get them if you're doing presentations or uh, having a play or something like that, a large gathering, a lecture, you want it to be a little more acoustically correct and this should uh, achieve that. Uh, so this is the, the floor plan. I'll try to point with the pointer here a little bit. Um, so the new uh, front entry area is over here. Uh, just uh, up from that, the pointer is not working very well. Uh, is the new admin and student services edition, and uh, as you drop down to the uh, southwest would be sixth grade, um, southeast seventh grade, uh, center towards the north eighth grade, with all the uh, elective uh, functions in the center, and the specialized programs up at the northwest. Um, the last area, I guess, to talk about is the music area, which is at the far um, southeast. That's the three rooms on the corner south of the gym. Those will all be remodeled with improved acoustics and a little more space and be a little more conductive to your music programs. All three, yep. So the one furthest to the left is band. That's the largest room. They need the most volume of space for acoustics. Probably they also need the most space. Um, the next one over in the middle is vocal, and the one on the end is orchestra. Yes, we're going to take out all the seats, and uh, I think we take every other tier and make it one tier so they have enough room for chairs to have their instruments, like if you have cellos or trombones or something, you can't have that close um, spacing. Uh, so we can do that just by building over the existing floor. We don't have to tear all that out and, and spend a bunch of money doing that. But, uh. And the multi-purpose room, correct, which is Yeah, it's actually that, uh, the way it's set up is the bleachers there would seat about 400 people, which is a little bit more than one grade level. Uh, and then there's also space on the floor for additional chair seating. And then the, the stage or platform area will just be whatever the district decides to use there for that. It's not a built-in stage, it would be something portable. And I,
Well, this will mirror exactly what we're doing over at Kern. So Kern is going to move into the facility in the same manner with the new seats that are coming out, with the new portable um, platform that we will have, and the acoustics in this room, we're setting it up so that you will be able to have plays and uh, performances in that room. And taking the small theater, as what I would call it, the small auditorium, taking that and making that into a true band room where the students can really practice and have a true band class. Um, that room, even though it is set up where you go down as you go in, right, there really isn't a platform for the kids to have their plays. Unlike Kern had that stage, theirs is still done on the floor in, in Wilson. So as we move over into this, I think it will provide us with better sound system, better acoustics, and a really nice way for us to set up for our parents to have um, that, that view of what's going on in that performance, and we can see more. It will more than, I would assume that the current auditorium seats may be 150, 200. Mm -hmm. Is that what we would think? So we're doubling it, I believe. Um, at least doubling and having space to lay down more t more chairs, and so this is the same um, the same setup. The one thing that the team did that really set up the specs, and that's a lot of my cabinet members and uh, teachers and principals, is we're trying to make sure it's equitable in both buildings. So as we did one, this, the the other building gets the same um, remodeling, the same structure, the same floor space pods, the uh, learning environment, um, and teaming, it's all set up the, the same way. Um, and I believe Stacy joined you on a trip out to uh, California or somewhere. Yes. Um, you, they went and visited facilities, and what we're seeing that we're making the small gyms into in both of the middle schools is what they witnessed in one of the schools, and Stacy just couldn't stop raving about how different the the climate and the culture will be by having this this setting yeah, that space will also still be used for lunch uh, breakfast and lunch as well so i think the improved acoustics and that will help that's a pretty loud space right now especially when you get a lot of kids in there. so it should be better acoustically for that as well What, when we when we schedule these, if the small gym is scheduled for practice or uh, for community teams, we will have to redo some scheduling and maybe work I differently. I'm more about the physical setting up. Okay. Like, well, are we not going to have those anymore? Oh, no. No, we will. Like, so how do I build a set? These things, you know, it's just stupid. Getting in the weeds. Mm -hmm. how they're going to do that. Right. With well, the, the, with the portable platform. Right. There'll be some things that they will be able to leave, and they will have to move things in and out each day. Yeah, the sets um, and uh, the platforms that we create, they'll be portable, so they will have to go in and out. So this is, uh, finishes like this don't photograph real well and then get projected on a computer, but the, the boards that have the finishes on them are in the back if you want to look at them as you, as you uh, or after the meeting, but we had a series of meetings with the uh, um, school district and, and went through several renditions of finishes for both schools. This is kind of the palette that was uh, arrived at uh, for Wilson. So there's a lot of uh, um, more uh, blues and greens and, and more, uh, the, the time we were talking about it was more uh, the, river kept coming out because they're closer to the river. Um, so blues and greens and grays uh, and there's some yellow uh, for the school colors. Pretty much the same material type as we're using in Kern. So we've got some more ceramic <coughs> tiles.
Before you come up, Daryl, Roger, if you could go back to a couple of things, and then I want to, um, Mr. Arthur, if I could also re uh, address maybe concerns about the play in the set. There may be some times that the, the teachers have to work together, and maybe there's a classroom, and maybe they switch. I want to make sure that everyone knows that that's important to us, that the plays and the events still occur, and that we wouldn't want to hinder that. Um, one thing that you don't show in this picture that I want to make sure that we're clear on is the safety vestibules, the safe yeah, entrance. That, um, it shows up in the plan. It does uh, not show up in the picture, but I want to be clear that everyone knows that we will have that just as we will at Kern. Yeah, if I the may, just, I'll just step sure. out the point real that'd be, quick here. That'd be fine. It's virtually the same setup like what we did at Kern. So the new main entry here, the same Just, yeah, just like currently at, at Madison during during the uh, uh, when the students are entering the buildings, all the doors, the front doors are wide open and they're entering the doors there. And then as soon as they get in the building, they, they lock it down. Right now, students in the that way, typically, unless there's a lot of kids in The security system that we um, we took to the board in May that we used at Madison, it's the same one that's here. It's already been uh, bid and approved by the board. All the exterior doors will have uh, will be secure and locked down just like we did at Madison. And the, the other piece is we'll have staff that have eyes on who's coming in the building as we do in the main entrance for the bus drop off as we will for the parent drop off. And then once the day starts, there will be no entrance in the parent drop-off. Everyone will have to come to the front. Yeah. The parking? Yeah. Yeah. Across? Okay, perfect. <coughs> Is there, there's learning commons areas for sixth and seventh grade. Is there a similar space designated for the eighth grade yeah. group?
that I've seen there for like So, um, Dr. Borthman, would you share some what Michaela's thoughts were about being able to use this common um, space for us? Would you join us, please? Because we brought Michaela in as we began to look at this, uh, because we knew we didn't have the funds to build out another band room or something. And so we brought Michaela in um, to ensure that she thought we could host plays in this area. Yeah, so as, as it currently stands, uh, a full-fledged performance play um, is not in our curriculum. Um, they do occur, um, and usually it's maybe once a year um, we have a play um, at the middle school. Maybe one in the fall, one in the spring, if everything kind of works perfectly. Um, but we, what we did do is identify that uh, there's an opportunity there, um, not only to have the portable stage, but also maybe even if necessary to have um, some type of curtain that can be hung from the top so that they would have an entrance and an exit there. That would, um, that would accommodate them being able to, they also talked about being able to build their, some of their set materials on casters so that they would be able to roll them in and out, which is common in technical theater production. Um, we also um, talked about the opportunity of also using some of our external partners to help with us as well, um, both with the Shannon Clear and with the new um, Ed and Polly Hoff Performing Arts Center at Pace, um, that there may be opportunities to collaborate with them as well. Yeah, square footage wise, the band the band space is getting bigger, um, and having a dedicated orchestra space um, has not been uh, possible in in the past. So what we we're trying to do is make sure that we ensured equitable opportunities for students at both Kern and Wilson when it came to the fine arts. gym the competition gym stays just just where it is with the same function as it always has except for you will not eat breakfast and lunch in there that goes to the other the older gym um, the locker rooms stay virtually in their same spot but they'll be getting a complete facelift new finishes new lockers um, getting rid of the old gang showers that aren't even used anymore but we do have a couple of individual showers in each one of those um, new uh, water closets, urinals, sinks, things like that. So they'll get a they'll get a facelift. In the, the, the multi-purpose room yeah. the bleachers see right at 400 and then there's probably room I'm just gonna wing it for maybe another 200 and chair seating on the floor yeah that was always a thought that if there was some something big that was gonna have a lot I think the other thing about the multi-purpose room is it is still going to be usable for uh, basketball or volleyball it's on a lesser scale. It's not going to have two courts. It'll have one. We have as an alternate in the bid is to get a new basketball goals for the main court. So it, it's still usable. I forgot to point out in the beginning that um, you know on your you should have a, an overall project budget here for all all three projects that kind of ties everything together even though we're just talking about Wilson tonight and then the, the floor plan 
So this estimate is <coughs> structured very similar to what I showed you with, with Madison and with Kern, but we broke it out into the broad categories of construction, you know, demolition, interior renovation, plumbing, HVAC, electrical, and exterior improvements. And you can see by the estimate, um, similar to Kern, it's, it's, uh, there is some heavy work done on mechanical systems, which was a big area of need. Uh, electrical, lighting, uh, new, you know, all new restrooms, plumbing, things like that. So that uh, takes up a, a pretty large part of the budget. We have a, a contingency of almost $600,000 built in that is basically used for unforeseen conditions or owner requested changes, uh, things like that. So with, <clears throat> with all those numbers together, uh, this, we're estimating this project to be around 13 million six hundred twelve dollars and two hundred eighty three which is slightly slightly under what we had for uh, Kern and Wilson is, is around ten thousand feet smaller but you know with the renovation areas in the timeline um, as I alluded to uh, earlier but design was basically completed in May uh, just just slightly behind to, to do the final complete completion. Um, I talked about the early bid schedule. Think, strategically thinking it, it would be better to bid in the fall. And we found even when we bid last year, um, Madison bid uh, January, February, where Kern was a little bit later. And I think we had less bidders. So, and I, uh, Roger and I made phone calls to probably a dozen contractors in the area, and most of them agreed that uh, the early bid schedule was fine. Um, it gets away from the holiday schedule and allow them to plan it, plan out their work you know, for the next year. Construction would begin, um, we'd, we'd probably do some mobilization while school's there, but we won't really go into the school until the school's out in May. And you'll have a construction period very similar to what uh, is going on at Kern right now. Um, we would move, um, we would have to move some things out of Wilson, you know, to, you know, before the construction area, and we'll we'll move them to the Madison campus in August. And we do plan on we'll take a look at Madison after uh, Kern finishes and see what things need to be spruced up a little bit. We've got some contingencies built in for painting and some things like that, because uh, we want uh, Wilson to move into a, a brand new looking facility as much as possible. Construction being completed in, in July of 2021, and then we move uh, Wilson back into Madison. So with that, uh, Roger and I would be happy to answer any questions. We did have quite a few questions ahead of time, that, <laughs> but I'm sure there are, which is fine, which is fine. You might as well address them when, when, when they come up. Uh, but for any um, continued questions that the board has, uh, now is the time and place to um, address our uh, presenters. Thank 
your entry. Special programs. Any, any questions from other board members? Hearing none, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Slauson and Mr. Myers. We will take this um, um, up then during our regular board meeting. We are adjourned with our public hearing. Now I am opening up the regular board meeting for the Council Bluffs Community School District Board of Directors. Mr. Wilson, would you please call the roll? Dr. Agres? Present. Mr. Minshaw? Present. Mr. McGlade? Present. Mr. LaFerla? Here. Mr. Arthur? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Present. As you are able, would you please rise with me uh, to observe a moment of silence? Please join with me the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have now our approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? I'll move we approve our agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, before us is the approval of our agenda. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And our agenda has been approved. Before us now is the approval of our uh, work session um, minutes and our regular board business meeting on September 24th. Is there a motion? Move to approve minutes from work session and regular business meeting of September 24th, 2019, as presented. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. And the motion is carried. Now is the time for public participation. This is a time for our uh, audience to address the board on board agenda items or any item that they are concerned with. If there's anybody who wishes to address the board, uh, please take your, uh, find your way to the podium. Seeing no one, we will move forward then with our superintendent's report. Dr. Murillo, would you please lead us through this part of the meeting? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Kozire. At this time, Dr. Borthman is gonna join us at the podium. Uh, it's time for us to present our fall 2019 map Results, um, I'm always excited when we have uh, data that we can look at. Um, I don't know, it's kind of a fun thing for me to see and I get excited during that time. And Dr. Borthman is gonna share with you an update. Remember the fall sets the baseline for the upcoming year. And it always gives us a starting place 
and something to look forward to as we move through the school year. So Dr. Vorthman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Merlo. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to provide you with an update on our fall 2019 uh, Measures of Academic Progress, or MAP, uh, testing results for both mathematics and reading. Uh, and before we start tonight, I just want to uh, refresh everyone uh, around our district goals um, that we identified earlier in the school year. Um, and I'm going to focus tonight on target 1.1 only. Um, and that is ensuring that at least 80% of our students are scoring at the average, high average, and high levels um, on mathematics and reading on the NWEA MAP assessment. Um, and remember, we also track growth as well, and those measures will be available when we do our winter and in our spring testing, and I'll give you a timeline for that before we conclude tonight. So I'm going to show you some data tonight by cohorts. And when I'm talking about cohorts, what I mean is similar groups of students. And we talk a lot about that when we bring you data. Um, and so we're specifically going to look at class of cohorts. And I'll identify those as we go through the presentation so you can see where those, co those groups of students are currently in our school buildings. So the first celebration tonight um, is we had, uh, on average, our cohorts grew by 1.7% um, when we compared the spring of 2018, which was the very first MAP administration we did, to the fall of 2019. So you look at four testing windows over the course of the last year uh, and, and one testing term, and we saw, on average, 1.7% growth in mathematics. Um, as I've uh, talked to the board in previous presentations, what we would like to see is about one and a half percent each year. And that tells us that we are on a sustainable path towards improvement. The other thing it helps us identify is that the fidelity of our implementation is getting better. So what we want to see is deep, rich implementation of the of the materials, the resources, the curriculum that we have in front of in front of young people, and that we're not seeing big spikes, peaks and valleys. We want to see a nice constant trajectory. Um, as learning improves. Um, so in mathematics, we're a little bit farther behind than we are in uh, reading language arts. If you recall, um, we did a revamp of uh, elementary reading four years ago. So we're in our fourth year. Mathematics, this is our first year of implementation um, district-wide uh, for math in both reading or in both uh, elementary and in our secondary schools. So we're, we're, we're seeing some growth in math. Um, but it's not quite as uh, aggressive as the growth that we're seeing in reading. And what you'll notice on this chart, I've identified starting on the, the far left, that's the class of 2023 or our current <coughs> kindergartners, all the way up to the 11th grade on the far right, which is the class of 2021. 20, uh, and there are no seniors listed here because seniors do not participate in the, in the MAP test because there is nothing to compare them to uh, after they get out of 11th grade. So what you'll see is um, a pretty constant uh, trend line there. A as I plotted a, a linear equation on there, what I found was we have a slight upward tick um, from kindergarten through 11th grade. Um, and we're teetering around uh, about 56% of our students meeting that uh, threshold of average, high average, and high. We look across the district. You'll notice, as I brought to you in previous years, second grade seems to be an outlier. And if you recall, um, second grade is the first time that our students take the test independently and we made that as a decision district-wide last year after our spring 2018 assessment that students would start taking that assessment independently in their second grade year both kindergarten and first grade uh, the test is administered to them by the teacher so they have some prompting instead of doing it 100 percent independently no, it, it takes them a little bit of time. I, what we see in winter is it ticks up. It ticks up a little bit more in spring. By the time they get into third grade, they have regained basically the ground. And that's not necessarily an indication of less learning. It's just an indication of a more rigorous computerized assessment that adapts based on their need during that second grade year. They're really bridging the gap from learning to read to reading to learn at that point. So. The next slide I'm going to show you um, is a little bit different type of slide, and it's going to show you the percent and change in those groups of students from the first time they took the assessment to the most recent assessment. 
And so what this char chart shows is how much growth happened between the spring of 2018 and the fall of 2019, how many percentage points those students grew in proficiency. And so what you'll notice is there's a slight decline in four different areas. The first two, uh, one at second grade, one at fourth grade. So the second grade one relates to the explanation that I just provided. It's the first time that students take that independently, we see a dip. Well, you'll notice fourth grade had a dip too. But if you count back two years, that's when they took the test in the spring of 2018, which was the year that we had them take the test um, uh, as the K, at the K2 test. So what we see is by the time they get through fourth grade and into fifth grade, we see, especially in reading, that dip that has occurred um, because of that, that test uh, at second grade. You'll also notice that uh, the class of 2025, which is seventh grade, and the class of 2022, which is 10th grade, have a very sig insignificant dip. It's about 0.7 in one and about 0.8 in the other. And that is sixth grade and ninth grade in our transition years. Um, they, are st they are still providing us some challenges um, in what we and how we make sure that students don't slide backwards in those two grade levels. Interesting, I'm going to show you in reading, that doesn't hold true, just in math. So um, w one of the nice things is that uh, as uh, Mrs. Smith is working with the high schools and middle schools, they're really focusing on making sure they have fidelity of implementation of those new math materials in all those grade levels across both our middle schools and high schools. So a great celebration for us in reading when we look at the work that has been done in our schools over the past year um, between the spring of 2018 and the fall of 2019. We had 5.8% on average growth in our cohorts. That's a tremendous amount of growth. Um, and frankly, it makes me a little nervous uh, because that's more than what is typical. Um, that's about three times what is typical. Um, so I, I don't like to see those great big spikes, only if we can sustain them over time. Um, and so we'll be watching this through the course of this school year to make sure that we are able to continue to build upon that growth that we've experienced this year. Uh, and you can see uh, the chart is uh, about 5% greater than what we saw in mathematics. Um, and that would hold true to what I would expect given that our implementation has been longer and deeper in literacy than it has been in mathematics. Um, you'll also notice that especially in that class of 2022, which is 10th grade, um, for years we had seen a tremendous dip on our state assessment scores in reading in 10th grade um, to the tune of between 15 and 18 percent dips. And you'll notice we do not see that dip in the map. Um, and I am certain that there was some type of challenge in that uh, assessment that made that norm group be out of whack. Um, and so I can assure you that our 10th graders are not achieving at a low level, uh, even though our state assessment said they are, they are right on track with their peers. Um, and you can see the, a slight upward trend line as well in the reading as well, um, area. Um, reading uh, cohort growth is stronger than math cohort growth. You'll see that we have an outlier in the second grade area, but beyond that, the only other outlier is ninth grade. Um, we made some adjustments this year to how we were cohorting ninth graders in the building. Um, and we believe that that will help us get out of that ninth grade slump um, that we have seen uh, for students coming out of eighth grade and into ninth grade. But really remarkable growth when you look across uh, third grade all the way through 11th grade, some making double digit gains um, since their first administration of math but as, as a group. Yeah. <coughs> Tremendous growth. Yeah, so what we, if you start backtracking cohorts, four years of implementation of new curriculum in elementary, I believe has helped us in middle school because we are now getting those kids through the system. They are our first ninth graders this year 
um, and uh, we, we push that strategically up through sixth grade. Um, so they're all benefiting from that. Um, I don't like to mess with something if it's not broken, uh, but we are reviewing our uh, 7 through 12 English language arts curriculum this year because it's time to do so. We haven't touched it since 2011, so it's a time for a refresh. Um, and what we're looking at is something that is complementary to what we're doing in, um, in elementary so that we see cohesion all the way through the system. Did we update the math middle school math curriculum as well? Last year, correct. That was last year was the first year of implementation of sixth through twelfth grade math. They we completely redid the whole thing all the way from kindergarten through twelfth grade. This is our second year of implementation for some people in elementary. We did a two year phase in for those folks. So we're lagging a little bit behind in math, which we would expect. We an implementation dip is very typical. Um, and reading is really starting to kind of blossom, which is great news. So where we're going from here, um, you'll, you'll soon start hearing chat around the district about students setting goals with their teachers around how many RIT score uh, points they're going to increase um, and what their goal is uh, for the winter administration. Uh, we'll also be sharing information with parents um, in report cards and at parent-teacher conferences um, through the buildings. Um, Mrs. Schult, Mrs. Smith and Mr. Schultz will be working with building principals to identify classrooms where they, we need to provide additional supports um, to make sure that students are progressing uh, at, at an appropriate level. And then we'll continue bringing you additional data um, and analysis uh, at two more points during the school year. Winter uh, in February, we'll bring you the performance data like we did tonight. But then we'll also have the growth data from fall to winter. And then again in May, we'll give you another check of the pulse um, we will have not only the performance data, we'll have growth data, and then we'll have longitudinal growth data. So you'll get to see over the course of two years how students in these cohorts have performed over time and what growth they've made. So with that, I would welcome any additional questions that the board might have. The board? We decide when when the testing times, when, when we do the testing. So. We made a decision to do it this early to set sort of a benchmark for we we to have a to win nwea sets a window of time and oh, we get okay. to choose where we want in that window of time last year we tested later on in the fall and we found that that didn't give us a very accurate picture of how much growth students made over the course of the year because there was so little time between fall and winter testing and so we moved it back to the beginning of the window. So this year we tested uh, the first two weeks in September. And we found that that was a much more reasonable um, way to test than in November like we did last year. And when you say growth, you're talking about RIT growth. Correct. Not the... Not, not, not performance growth. I'm right. talking about students being able to make progress on their individual goals. Right. Um, in some cases, they only had five weeks to do that instead of yeah. 12. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Borthman. Um, and now I'm going to invite um, Ms. Smith and Mr. Schultz up to the platform, um, to the podium. They are going to bring the board an informational presentation on our SAMS program and the process and the changes. Um, as we begin to look at reorganizing kind of the cabinet and um, responsibilities of each cabinet member, as you probably remember that the SAMs really reported to Mr. Hamilton. Uh, as we begin to look at each area and what direction each of the cabinet members had underneath them, uh, Julie and Mark really believed that there was a better and tighter alignment for them to come up under school leadership. Uh, really working with the SAMs and ensuring the SAMs because we saw in our, if you remember our survey data that talked about our, our paraprofessionals and some of our other employees wanting feedback and wanting to have that communication from the SAMs who works directly with them. We really felt like instead of asking Mr. Hamilton to take on another piece of, uh, of the pie, per se, to learn feedback and how do you help the SAMs with feedback, but to better align them so that their work of the SAMs and the work of the principal really begins to align in that building. 
And uh, so I asked um, Julie and Mark if they would do a presentation tonight on the work that they are beginning to uh, really mm -hmm. assist and support our SAMs and how that alignment is to our goals of the district and how now we really feel like um, it's gonna take that next level approach because we've been having the SAMs in our building for quite some time and very proud of the work that's occurred during that time, but we'd like to almost do a 2.0 and kind of level it up and get it to that next level. So, Mr. Schultz, the floor is yours. Dr. Merlo, thank you so much. Um, board, we're excited tonight to talk about school administrative managers. Uh, first thing that we want to share is about the purpose. Um, it's a great resource that we have in our schools, and the number one focus of the, of the SAM is to support the principal to focus their time on instruction. And we know that if the principal is spending more time on instruction, they can impact um, teacher uh, behavior and student achievement. And as Dr. Borkman shared, we are getting some results, and we know that this is another piece of the puzzle to help improve schools. Um, so Dr. Merlo said it's been around for a while. Um, we did the math. It's actually been around 12 years. So we're in year 12. Um, and thanks to funding to, to kick off about 12 years ago, the IOS Foundation supported us with this initiative. Um, and it is in about 23 different states in our nation. So it's, it's, a, pretty, um, it's a pretty big, wide initiative that schools are doing. And so within that 12 years, uh, training for the SAMs and principals was provided by the National SAM Innovation Project and really included some external coaching. So um, other people coming into our district to work with our principals and SAM teams. Um, so we kind of been thinking about, well, 12 years is a long time. It's, it's probably time for, like Dr. Marilla said, a 2.0, maybe a little reboot. Um, so one of the things with the, with with Julie and I being able to have the opportunity to work with our SAMs and SAM principals, um, we realized that we probably wanted to get some clarity around the, the role of the SAM. Um, so last February, um, we had um, updated the job description for SAMs, and you had approved that. So I just want to review a little bit about what the SAM does on a kind of a the day in the life of a SAM. Um, one of the things that they do is they have a daily meeting with the principal, and Julie's going to talk in depth about what that is, but it really is to help make sure that the principal has that focus on instruction for that given day. Um, they manage all non-instructional classified staff um, at the site to ensure um, that things are running smoothly, you know, paraprofessionals, custodians, things like that. Um, they are, they are, they respond to, you know, parent calls, first responder things. They also manage and help manage the schedules, um, some special events at the school, um, supervised cafeteria when students are in the lunchroom, um, making sure that buses are running well and, and they're that contact there. Um, some, depending on the site, assist the principal with managing the school budget and ensuring that that is, um, is going smoothly and also help with our standard resp response protocol. So by having a person in the building doing these things, um, the principal is doing something too and the goal is, and they're, they're having a lot of success, is that they are focusing on instruction because of this, so it's very important that we have that. So some other changes, and so Julie and I have the opportunity this year, and we're very excited, that we do have oversight of our SAMs, and we are able to align um, our focus on feedback and the support we're doing for principals, that we can do that with SAMs as well. And so one of the biggest things that happened is last week, Julie and I had an all-day training, and we were trained on how to be uh, they call them time coaches or time, yeah, time coaches. And so that external coaching that we used to have, that'll be done by Julie and myself. And so we'll be able to go to schools and coach, not just the principal like we do every week, but also once a month we're gonna be focusing with the, with the SAM. And so that all day training also um, gave us an opportunity to not just get trained, but live it. So we actually have SAMs ourselves ourselves, and our Sam is um, Amy Peterson, our admin administrative assistant, and so she meets with Julie and I every day, and she's amazing, and we, we meet for about 20 minutes, and she just looks at our calendars, because we have this calendar called a time tracker, which Julie will talk more about, that all of our schools use, and she looks at our plan, she goes, which schools are you going out to tomorrow, what's your focus, what are you going to help them with, what kind of follow-up do I need to schedule, she really helps us, it's been We've been doing it for a week, and it's absolutely made us very sharp. 
I can see Julie back there. It's made us very, very sharp. Um, so it helps us to manage our time. And it's pretty important, too, because we spend a lot of time in schools. And we want to know, is our impact um, from our time in schools making a difference on principal performance and therefore impacting student achievement? Um, so we do believe it is. We just want to get some more data. Um, so that, that's pretty great. So another thing that we do um, monthly, we have our SAMs come up to ESC and we um, do some whole group professional learning with them, when that group. Um, um, as Dr. Murillo said, Mr. Hamilton did that in the past, so we have an opportunity to do that too and align it. So we have two big um, topics that we will, we will work on this year. One is just the overall SAM process and ensure that they are, the, the school administrative managers really adhering to that. Some maps around here. And, <laughs> um, and our focus of feedback in the district to help them to provide feedback to the, per the people that they are um, helping manage and supervise in the school. And so about once a month, when we go out and coach in schools, we're gonna observe the SAM and the principal have their daily meeting and ensure that it does meet the criteria that um, we set. And we're gonna review that and give them feedback on it. And we're also gonna look at the principal um, data that they have, because um, that time tracker calendar they track everything. And so when principals are in, when they're in a meeting with teachers, when they're in classrooms, when they're meeting with parents, they track all that data. And so we're gonna look at that to see, is it really focused more on instruction? And then we'll look at some of that map data too to see, are we seeing an impact in our building? So we're very excited with that opportunity. Um, so Julie's gonna talk about kind of more detail about the, the, the day in the life in that um, daily meeting with the SAM and the principal. Julie? Put that in. They just put that in. <laughs> so a lot of what Mark spoke to you about was really about the Sam the person, what that person does on a day-to-day -day basis. What I'm going to talk about is Sam the process. And this is one of the things that we really feel like could probably use a good reboot right now with looking at that. So one of the things that we learned in our training was the power of that daily meeting. And um, the reason it's so powerful um, for two, it's for two reasons. It gives the principal an opportunity to have kind of a guided reflection of their day that they had the day before. Um, and that's what it kind of starts off with. How, what did you, you know, what did you do? Was it instructional? Did you intend what you're going to do? Was it instructional? If not, what was it? What kind of instruction was it? We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then um, look to see what else, you know, the calendar, the time tracker that they have to do. But number three up here is probably the most important piece, and that's analyzing the principal data. So on a daily basis, at a meeting, um, the SAM takes an opportunity to pull up a piece of data, and I'll show, you, I'll show you what this looks like in a second, and it asks the principal to analyze, is this really how you wanna be spending your time instructionally? Do you have some other priorities you might wanna be doing, and if so, how can I schedule that in and help you get to doing that? So that, that powerful piece of the process is what's really going to help make a difference. It's not just about getting an instruction, it's about what you're doing with instruction and are you needing to be where you're at to make a difference in the building. That's probably a piece that has kind of been neglected and that we're going to really do a lot of focus, time, and energy on. Um, you know, then the, the rest of you know, sharing any management concerns. Um, number five there, making sure that for the next day or for the next time period that the principal is scheduled at least 50% of their time in instructional practices. And 50, over 50% 50 is kind of that tipping point where um, a principal really becomes an instructional leader if they're doing that. They are the lead learner in that building when they're spending at least 50% of their time in instructional practices. So it becomes really, that number becomes pretty important. And then lastly, celebrate the wins. Um, it's a nice place, it's, it's a nice for principal to hear on a daily basis what they've done as working well and, and how they've been able to reach goals that they have set for that previous day with looking at that. So this process of the daily meeting, again, is something that we really want to focus on with our SAMs to help them help the principals to really be reflective thinkers on a daily basis about how they're being instructionally in their building. Instruction, as I said before, it takes on a lot of looks. I think oftentimes we think that means being in classrooms, and it does mean being in classrooms. But you'll see six different categories up here of what could be instruction or be considered instructional for a principal. And that first one, seeing, um, seeing instruction, that could be a long observation, it could be walkthroughs, it could be working with students in a classroom, 
Um, it could be helping supervise students in a classroom, but all that time they're watching instruction and seeing what's going on. That's one component. We would like to see that piece up there relatively high. The second one is feedback. And although that, you know, that's not directly in the classroom like before, but feedback is very important. You know that it's been our goal. And the three types of feedback that we would look at um, principals working with their teachers with, um, we can track that in all those ways. And are they spending time, or how are they spending their time with feedback, and what type of feedback they're giving. The next one is working with groups. And this could be in a professional learning community. It could be in professional development. But any time they're working instructionally with groups with teachers um, is also valuable instructional time. Working with others, that would be parents, IEP meetings, uh, when we come into the building as our supervisor and work with them and go into classrooms with them. All of those things are also considered instruction. Um, and time getting ready for that. It takes time to plan professional development. It takes time to look at assessment data and figuring out your next steps. Again, um, another instructional component. And the last one is the opportunity to show and model for teachers. So when, um, when a principal takes that time to go in and show an instructional practice that's being modeled or show how to work with a particular student, again, very good, wise use of time. So we want to be able to see and track what are you doing instructionally with your time. <clears throat> so time tracker allows us to do that very easily. So because of the daily meetings and when the, um, Sam goes back and makes sure that that first step of did you say what you're going to do and what did you really do with instruction in those pieces, um, it allows to code that in certain ways. And then with the click of a button, they can pull up a graph like this. Now I'm going to tell you this is my graph. And it was my graph for three days last week, OK? So just, just so you know. But you can see by this graph and looking at it, out of uh, 27 hours, I was in instructional practices up in the corner. Four, you maybe can't see it, but 14 hours and 39 minutes, I was involved in, instruction, in an instructional practice in some way. Um, and then you can see down at the bottom across, I know this is really super hard to see, but those are all the categories we just talked about. And you're going to notice three of those in red. And those are in red because those are ones that I chose that, that I said, you know what, I really want to track these and make sure that I'm doing these well. These are very important to me. I want to make sure that I am getting good time in those three areas. And so a question my Sam might ask me when I come in and saying, hey, Julie, you really wanted to do uh, celebratory feedback, but you've only spent 0.9% of your time on that. Would you like to increase that next week? What can I schedule for you? Who would you like to do that with? And she can get that on my schedule, because if it's on my schedule, it's more likely that I'm going to get out there and do it than if I just try to use this old memory to do it. Um, another thing it shows, uh, again, that they could just talk about is, as you can see the graph at the top, um, that's the combined observations versus the combined feedback time. And mine, in those three days, was 53% of uh, combined feedback versus 46% of being in classrooms. And so that also, it just gives me an it. She could ask me a question like that. Do you need to do more observations? How are you feeling about your observation to feedback ratio? And then I could make that decision. I might say, I feel fine with that. I think that's pretty good. Or I might say, you know, I don't. Let's schedule some more observation time in classrooms. And so that's what becomes that analysis of what you're doing really becomes powerful. So this is one way. This is just one chart that's in there. I'm going to show you a quick another chart. Another chart. Um, this chart is, whoa, it, it did, there we go. Um, didn't even need your help, Dave. Um, <laughs> uh, this chart shows, uh, in, in Time Tracker, you have um, the ability for everything that you do to connect it to a person or to a school or to a group of teachers um, or to a group of principals, a team of principals, if you would like. And so with each thing that you put in there, you can say, I'm connecting this to um, Abraham Lincoln High School and Mrs. Bellows, and so I could connect it both ways. What this chart can show me then is how much time did I spend in this, now this actually shows more days, and you're going to see, wow, you've got three spikes there, and I'm going to tell you why I got three spikes there. That was the time I spent in my all-day training, and it was with Mark and one of the principals and the, uh, the man who was there, Mark Schellinger, and that's why those people are so high, so that's kind of an oddity. Um, but if I looked at the rest of them, I could pick out what my, my Sam could say to me, um, I see you only have one hour or whatever with this particular person. Do you need to increase that? Do you want to increase that? And then I could schedule more time based on what, you know, what I felt as how, how he's seeing that. Also, if you click down into this, it will show with that person, what did I do with that person when I spent that time with them? 
how much time was spent in those different areas that I looked at. So am I spending all my time with this person in classrooms or am I spending a lot of my time um, doing other things with that? So these become really the power behind the process of working with SAMs. And we really believe that when principals can analyze what they're doing like that, more than just saying, I'm 50% instruction, <laughs> what are you doing with that 50% instruction is really going to help make a difference too to help them make choices about the work um, in which they are going to do the, ne uh, do the next day in the week and et cetera. So um, with that, is there any other information that we can share with you? <coughs> Anything from the board? I feel like I need a Sam in my life now. <laughs> uh, are these this time tracker? The principals track log that time for themselves, or the the Sams um, enter the those? <coughs> it can be done either way. Uh, both the Sam and the principal have the ability to put in um, an, an event and log it. How they would do that? When you're with your Sam for the meeting and you go back through. Um, when she asks a question like, okay, so you were there and you wanted to do observations, about how much time of there was observations? And then she can go in and fix if I say, it was about 20% of my time and really the rest was on um, non-directive feedback. And so she can go in and fix that. Or I might say, oh, we had to, you know, fire drill went off, we had to exit the building, so give me about 10 minutes of non-instructional time there because it really wasn't instructional. So mm -hmm. she can go back in and fix that um, after we have our meeting and talk about it. She could also set meetings in there for me. If I said, hey, I, I need to meet with Corey on some stuff, can you set up a meeting for me? She can set it up and do all the things with that. So okay. either person can set it up. Yeah. This presentation was very helpful for me um, because I think, and I don't know how this happened, but I think I had an impression that SAMs really dealt with things in the building that, you know, discipline and, you know, concerns and questions and help with parental things and maybe some of the things that are not so fun on a daily <laughs> basis. And I, I guess I was kind of, and I don't know if there's any truth to that or not, but I guess I was kind of concerned that maybe that could be a very high burnout job, you know, if that's really what you're dealing with every single day, but it's, uh, it sounds kind of like the SAM is really leading the principal through the reflection process every day of how, do, how should you be spending your time, how do you want to be spending your time, and how can I help you do that? And we do think this is something that needs a reboot, a focus on this. We, we um, you know, that's one of our goals with this thing is to really get this process really solid with that so that they do have that. Um, that voice with the principal and that push with the principal and in the training they kept saying make them a little uncomfortable make them a little uncomfortable mm -hmm. um, and our Sam makes us a little uncomfortable at times <laughs> Mark <Make> <laughs> um, that was one of the things um, that she had said too she said wow for the first time I feel like I'm really affecting buildings by helping you guys get out and manage and, and see what um, help you manage your time and think through your things. That was an insight that, our, that she had after about two days of being our SAM. So, yeah, um, yeah I think it has and a lot I of And I think power. I ought to, to follow up on that. Mr. LaFerla, one of the things that I questioned when I got here is we had Model 3, we never had a Model 1. And I really <laughs> wanted to see us, I had some concerns that you had exactly, uh, was every building the same? Did we all have the same understanding? Did we all know the purpose of the SAM and what their roles and responsibilities was? That was why the first step of redoing the job description was so important to me because I found it was not the same in every building that I visited. And I really felt like it was time for us um, because of the effort and the focus that we have is that every resource that we put in the building needs to be aligned to the goals and the mission of the district. And so it was really important to me that we begin to align them and no longer are they doing different things no matter which building. It's going to take us a while because I still think even though we're starting down this path, it's going to take us probably all this year to kind of redirect this and then get it where we want it really solid next year. Um, because we had, um, you know, they were kind of given autonomy to use them as they thought, as kind of the direction that I heard. Um, so I just want to, not that they were using them poorly, I just really would love to see that we're all going in the same direction and, and that everybody is using them the same and they're all trained and, and it's with fidelity. Right. I just had a question. So do we feel, what percentage of our schools or SAMs currently operating like that? They're really having that impact relationship. Is it 
small number right now, something well, based on for the future? You know. <laughs> you know, honestly, we haven't had time to go out and really observe meetings and look at that. We know the people who were trained with us the past few days, and I could say those people are out there doing that with fidelity with our new SAMs and our new principals that were trained that way. Um, I could say it was a surprise for a veteran SAM to come in and, and hear some of the ways to do that, and it wasn't something that she had particularly done before. Um, so it's hard to say a percentage right now with looking at that. I think we'll be able to look that a little bit more clearly once we, did, once we really start attending those um, meetings and, and having that discussion and giving feedback on those meetings. The uh, instructional time tracker, mm -hmm. um, how, how long have we used that? Using that in well, all of our... Well, it's been around 12 years, but it's improved uh, like 12,000% since way back when I was, I had one of the first SAMs in the district and it was nothing like it is now. Um, it's really become a much more functional tool than it used to be in the past. And so, um, you know, with each update, we're really not sure how well trained our principals are on it um, with some of that, as a, and even with some of our SAMs who have been around a long time on really the functionality of everything you can do with that. Do we have, do we know the, to what degree of fidelity they're using it currently? You want to take that one? You, you know, it's a great question. And we have access to all their time tracks. Sure. So we've been able to review those and those are, they're all doing it. It's up okay, to date. Good. So like what you said, what percent? We know it's not 100%, but that is our goal. Um, and we're going to get there. Um, and the time tracker, when it first came out 12 years ago, or even before that, it was on a CD-ROM. Mm -hmm. And you had, to lo yeah. Yeah, you had to load it on everybody's desktop. Yeah. Now it's in the cloud, it's on their iPhone, it's very seamless, mm -hmm. and it's just updates mm -hmm. you know, so quickly. So it's really a useful tool that they have. They can just look down, they can get notifications. You know what, you got a meeting in the classroom, 15 minutes, get on down there. It's really, really helpful. And even two years ago, you couldn't do that. But I think from Revising the job description and setting new expectations for the SAM, it, it moved some people's cheese around a little bit for them. And it's going to take us a while to really get it aligned. Um, but I'm really glad that Mark and Julie is going to take this on for me. Um, the other piece that is really great to see is that we're not bringing external people in to take principal's time. But mm -hmm. Mark and Julie are in every building every week for an hour or more. And by them doing that, they can also incorporate that into their time that they're there and um, really help bring this alive and hold them more accountable to using it correctly. Um, because I think one of the things that was very concerning to me was that they were first responders on everything and even discipline. And I, uh, we met with principals last year at the, in the spring, I think it was spring or was it fall, when we kind of began to talk about it and uh, change kind of that direction and set some clear boundaries around that. Um, do we, so how many SAMs do we have currently? Well, we, terrible because I think yeah. it's my area. <laughs> well, we yeah. have SAMs in all the secondary schools. So mm -hmm. all four are there, not one at Canesville. We have them at, we don't have one at Crescent. Um, we don't have one at Longfellow or Carter Lake because we have APs there, but the other elementaries we do. Who is counting? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We don't have one at Crescent. Right, there's not um, one at Crescent. That's correct. So. Um, and do we feel that our principals currently, we know what percentage of our principals currently are actually leveraging the SAM to drive instructional leadership? Yeah, I think, I think I all. all? I think they're all doing that. Um, we want to make sure that they're doing it to this fidelity, because you've heard that word, and Dr. Borthman said that word quite a bit. You know, once we really go out and, and observe and, and coach and really model that for them, we're going to get there. But every leader in our, in our district understands that the SAM, uh, the purpose of the SAM is to help them focus more on instruction, and that's what they're doing. But we can definitely improve it. That's why we're revising. 2.0. All the SAMs currently, or our SAMs are funded from different lots of money based on need at school. They are funded a little bit by Iowa West Foundation, and then the balance comes out of the general fund. Um, and I know we're kind of unique in having SAMs. I mean, 
that I think is compared to yeah, um, a lot of our counterparts. Um, the schools where we have, where we're, I guess, do we feel this works well as a model for us? Or is that what this process is about? And then how do we tweak it? And then how does it work with TLC? How do I as a, is this gonna drive where that, where all of our systems work better because that yeah. principal is focusing on yeah. instructional leadership or? No, um, there's been a lot of study around <laughs> this and when it first began. Um, this, the SAMS project is really a, a tool to use and what they found is really academic achievement really moves when you get that 50, 51% of your principal being able to focus on that instruction and be in the classrooms and have the planning time with teachers and to really be, I, I would say, immersed in what's happening in the classrooms. So the SAMS is really the purpose is to help the principals manage their time and assist in some of the areas of the dish in the building mm -hmm. so that frees up that principal. Um, they may be a first responder to a classroom where a student um, needs some support, but they would then have a, a place in which they hold that student with them and spend time with them while that principal finishes their observation. Then the principal comes back and handles the discipline. That's that extra support that they provide where if you didn't have a SAM, and we have just a principal in a building, if a student needed support, a principal would have to leave that classroom and come out. Mm -hmm. So it's providing that opportunity and removing some of the obstacles sometimes that what I call management side of the house that can get in the way of the principal being able to find time to be in classrooms or find time to show up at the PLC meetings or the grade level meetings. And that really kind of provides them with that additional support. Um, and uh, in, the, in doing that, it provides us with that, when I was talking about all those layers of support that we provide our principals like instructional support with the instructional coaches. So you have SAMs, you have instructional coaches, it's building that team, that leadership team in each building to really help move that building. Um, and the principal can't do it alone, so they need the support. So now it's about are we aligning the work of the SAMs to really come in strategically, laser-like focus, to help that principal meet that 51% of instructional time and then 49%, you know, doing other other principal job duties. So do we see that that same kind of breakdown in our schools where if I've got maybe struggling, let's say, classrooms or, or if I've got some education instruction kind of struggling, do I find that we're not using those resources as well? <coughs> or, I mean, is there a direct correlation between, hey, look, good SAM team with the principal, good other things, then that leads to quality, inst quality instruction in the class and good gains in, in learning from our kids? Well, I think what you're asking Just is, curious. can I tell you there's a correlation between one, two, three, and four? And I would say to you, that having a high quality principal that's really hitting it on all cylinders and building a good leadership team around and using mm -hmm. their teachers to also assist in that, mm -hmm. it takes all of that. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you one outweighs the other because every day something different happens in a building. Mm -hmm. So by being able to put all of those pieces of the puzzle together in a building and a principal being able to come around and be a real good support and build a team I've always heard it's about can you build a team? And you can have the best people on the bench, but if you don't have a team, you won't be successful. And this is about putting together that team for our principals. And it's been something that's been embedded here that I've questioned some. But I really believe that if we can strategically align and help every building principal build that team and get in those classrooms and support teachers and pull on teachers, <coughs> that are really doing some good things and use them to help them lift up that building, that's when we're gonna turn every building around in this district to be high achieving. Questions from the, the board, any other? One parting question. We um, had an opportunity uh, this evening uh, to meet with a couple of IASB uh, members um, 
and they uh, ask us to, you know, they, to keep in mind for you, what is the most important data that you're seeking? And how then will that data help us as a board uh, make decisions regarding the uh, uh, decisions that we have to make uh, uh, at the board table here? So what is the most important data that you're looking for? And how then can you translate that information that you gain from the data to help us make, uh, use that data to make the decisions that, that we need to uh, help student achievement? It's a great question, Dave. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say um, it's gonna go right back to student achievement data. Um, when you go into that brown room and you have your meetings, when you walk in there, you see it on the wall. It's, it's what we look at, our executive cabinet members, every week we look at that data. Um, it's right now, it's the map. It's, it's efficient, we can grab it, we can look at it three times a year, we can see growth over time, um, and it helps predict, predict, predict um, success. And it tells us how we're doing. And so I would say that student achievement data across the board is pretty critical for us. You know, on the other side of the brown room, you've got things about social and emotional learning and, and things we're doing with feedback with teachers. We know if we do that, again, it impacts that student achievement data. That's why it's on the wall when you walk in. That's the most important data we have. Um, I think just asking that question, how we can help you to understand it, to make some decisions, um, is allow us to continue to have conversations with you during board meetings, inviting Dr. Um, Worthman in. Um, we present that to you, and we can connect that to the work that we're doing in schools with, with our principals, with our teachers. Um, the more information we can share with you, the better informed you're gonna be to make some decisions. And if I might add, when will you have principals in the Brown Room posting their data? Because we're not gonna post that data. We want the principals to own that data. And so you're going to have them coming in. Yeah, um, the, next week we meet with them for their principals um, meeting. And so it's gonna be a, we get, we get them all in that Brown Room. We kinda have, get the stickers out, we put the things up, uh, do a lot of reflecting. And there's something very social about that too, is when you, you have your data and you put it up on the wall. Um, we, we own it. There's a lot of ownership for that, too. So, uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Before now is our resolution, resolution section. Uh, is there a motion? Move to approve plan specifications and form of bid for Wilson Middle School renovation project. We have a motion. motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, Mr. Wilson, um, first, uh, we're approving the plan specification in form of bid for the Wilson Renovation School uh, Project. Mr. Wilson, would you please call the roll? Dr. Agres? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Minshaw? Yes. Mr. McGlade? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. And the motion has been approved. This concludes our business. Before we do leave, uh, we had an opportunity uh, before our regular board meeting here to have some uh, reflection time. We did, um, for the last couple of weeks, we've gone through a self-evaluation process and we had time to be able to sit down and, and discuss the outcome of that uh, assessment. Uh, we were guided through that process uh, by uh, Ms. Um, Bridget Johnson and Mr. Harry Hyogenthal he from Iowa Association of School Boards, and they gave us some, um, they offered, they led us in giving us time to uh, reflect on, on what our goals are and what we're looking forward to in uh, preparing future goals. Uh, and that's what I got out of it. Uh, would anybody else like to add additional information? I just think that we've had a repu reputation of a functional board, and we've been blessed to continue with that. Um, so to grow and reflect uh, constructively and positively, um, I think that's been a goal since I've been on the board. And just to continue with that process and seeking outside um, guidance to continue with a lot of positive and struggling things that happen as a board member. Okay, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>